What is going on guys? Welcome back to We One Pigs. My name is Jacob, aka the Freckled Salamander, here to bring you my quick pig video for UFC 297. But before we get into this week's quick pig video, make sure you go to We wantpicks.com become a i mean what do we do become a premium member of the day it's only ten dollars a month last week me and angelo combined were up over five units i was up over three units just myself and if you guys are here for just my picks for just my bets if you take that ten dollars divide it by seven because there's not only me and angelo involved in we want picks it's running mouth mma there's three of them it's the mma minute it's autumn if you like the southern hemisphere taste of mma if you break it all the way down seven people ten dollars four events a month my picks for this week are only 36 cents what are we doing you don't have 36 cents to support me support the channel lock of the week hit last week as well let's get right into wheelpicks.com ten dollars a month become a premium member today make sure you like the video subscribe if you are new let's get right into the action quick pick video for ufc 297 let's roll baby Whoa. First off, we got Malcolm Gordon versus Jimmy Flick. And this one is a close fight. We got Jimmy Flick as a slight underdog. And I think I like Jimmy Flick in this matchup. Listen, I'm not all over Jimmy Flick. I'm not like loving Jimmy Flick because this guy is tough. He showed his toughness in his last fight. Just eating the leg kicks, trying to work through the leg kicks. The leg kicks couldn't quite work through those positions through that situation. But he is a tough dude. Malcolm Gordon equally as tough in my mind. What it comes down to for me is I believe Malcolm Gordon is the better striker of the two. Jimmy Flick can handle the strike. I know he kind of got steamrolled by Charles Johnson, but that was after a layoff. It is what it is. Malcolm Gordon should be the better striker in this matchup. The issue for me is Malcolm Gordon is probably going to wrestle. He's probably going to shoot a takedown. When you're shooting a takedown against Jimmy Flick, that's where he wants to be. He likes those sweeps. He likes working off his back with those triangles. Kind of a jiu-jitsu nerd, but he's a little bit tougher than like the, the typical jiu-jitsu nerd that we kind of give shit for on this channel. So, I believe that Malcolm Gordon, if he keeps Keeps this standing can win this fight. I don't think he's going to keep it standing. I think he's going to try to shoot a takedown. He's going to work at his offensive wrestling, offensive grappling, and yeah, he can win the fight that way, but that's where Jimmy Flick wants to be, and I think that Malcolm Gordon is going to find himself in some trouble against Jimmy Flick in that guard if he chooses to wrestle. So I'm going Jimmy Flick here. Slight dog, slight pick, no money, nothing like that. Let's move on to the next one. Jasmine versus Priscilla in this one. I'm telling you right now, Jasmine at minus five. Minus 370, whatever she is, I get it. And this is going to look like, oh, of course Jasmine dominated this fight. Minus four. She should have been minus 800. Or it is going to be the parlay buster of this card. Because from what I know from Jasmine, and we know her very well on this channel, we were all over Jasmine as a big underdog versus Miranda Maverick to upset her because we know that she has good wrestling. If she comes in with a wrestling game plan, she's going to steal. Roll Priscilla. Now, Priscilla's got good takedown defense. If you watch that Miranda Maverick fight, she's got good takedown defense. But once she's on her back, she's going to stay on her back, right? I mean, she's just flat on her back. She doesn't really have anything to offer, but she has good takedown defense. What I worry about with Jasmine in this fight is Jasmine is a fun fighter. Jasmine is an emotional fighter. Jasmine is a bad bitch, and she will get in the pocket she will throw she will get in brawls and she enjoys that brawling style she enjoys getting in the pocket throwing get hit she's screaming she's bloody she doesn't give a fuck against priscilla you don't want to brawl you do not want to brawl with a brawler Jasmine, if you're watching this video, you don't want to brawl with a brawler. Get your takedowns. Get your win in front of the home fans. You don't have to show up and show out. You don't have to try and get a knockout because if Jasmine stands and tries to brawl with a brawler, Priscilla will sit there. She will bite down and she will sit on heavy shots and she can hurt Jasmine. So my pick is Jasmine. She's got all the tools to win. But if she starts fucking around and starts brawling with Priscilla... This fight could get very interesting very fast. I would be careful chasing and putting, you know, Jasmine to all these parlays. I get it. She should, but she loves to brawl, especially in front of the home fans. These women get emotional. You know how those women be. I don't actually know, uh, but I've heard, you know, a lot of my friends have 
girlfriends or wives. A lot of them are married, happy with families, and they tell me how women are a lot of times. So I don't have a lot of interactions with them. We're working on it, though. And uh, Johan versus Sam Patterson. And this one is like, you guys saw Weston Wilson last week. You saw Weston Wilson last week. Looked like he had never done a hard spar a day in his life. Had no striking defense. Didn't react well to getting hit and just had no other answers for that. Well, Sam Patterson is kind of that same guy. Sam Patterson is another guy where it's like, has this guy ever been in a striking match where somebody can connect with his chin? Because his striking defense is so lackluster. And that was at 155. Sam Patterson had success at 155 because the dude's six foot nine at 155, and he used his length in the striking. His striking defense, he was able to use his length. In the grappling, especially, he was able to use his long, lanky limbs. Lanky, lengthy limbs. Some people are lanky, and some people are lengthy. Um, now coming to 170, now that's gone. All the length advantage is gone. He's still going to be taller and longer than Johan, but he just got sniped by a 5'8 dude. Now he's fighting a six foot one Johan who all he knows is throwing heat. Now, listen, I, don't, I know Johan's not like, it's like super accomplished guy. That's like really good everywhere and an extremely good fighter. But what he does, he does pretty well. He throws a big right hand and he's pretty accurate with it. And if he throws a big right hand on Sam Patterson in this fight, Sam Patterson's probably going to sleep. So I got to go with one plus one equals two. Sam Patterson, when he gets hit, it seems like he's going to get knocked out. Last time he got knocked out, he was trying to wrestle Mark Goddard for the next 15 minutes. They couldn't even get him out of the octagon. I was, ah, he was going crazy. I think his brain is scrambled. Johan throws that right hand. He's pretty accurate with it. I'm going with Johan in this matchup. The UFC debut of Sam Patterson at 170. I don't think that's the answer. He probably should have stayed at 155, used that length, it's going to be a trouble for him. In my mind, I think Johan finds the finish. I'm going Johan in this matchup. Jillian versus Pauliana Viana. And both these girls, by the way, beautiful. I mean, both these girls are beautiful. If I had to, you know, picking against either one of these females is not something I enjoy doing, right? You guys know week after week, I have the utmost respect for females, their female empowerment, and female women's MMA. In this matchup, I will say, I don't know if you go back to Jillian's record, you go through, I know it's 12 and eight. And you're like, ah, 12 and eight. Like, is this girl really UFC caliber? She is. Okay. She's still young. She's improving. This is the fight in my mind where if you're Jillian and you are supposed to be a girl in this division, we need to see the improvements right now. We need to see the improvements in the striking. We need to see the improvements in the takedowns because Pollyanna Viana will get aggressive in the striking. You need to not panic in those situations. You need to be able to return fire or actually level change into takedowns because Jillian Robertson has never really lost to anybody that she's the better grappler than. And in this matchup, she should be the better grappler than Pollyanna Viana. But I want to see some improvements in the stand-up. I want to see some improvements in the takedowns, in the offensive wrestling, not just off your back, not just in the just a jujitsu nerd type shit. So in this matchup, if she stays on the feet, I think Pollyanna is the better striker. But Pollyanna is susceptible to getting taken down. And when she is taken down, she will be off her back, just kind of trying to throw up arm bars and triangles. And Juliana should be wise to that. So Juliana should be the better grappler. She's never really lost when she's the better grappler in a matchup. So again, one plus one sometimes does equal two. I'm taking Jillian in this match to get the fight to the ground, be on top, get nasty, and be able to do what she does. But I want to see some improvements also in the striking from Jillian. It's time to show that you can be that complete fighter, and I think Pollyanna could be that matchup for her. So I'm going Jillian, and I kind of like her in this matchup. Let's move on. CD, is it CD? Sir he, CD. Versus Roman Tavares, and this matchup is a rematch from the Contender Series. It was a little bit of an early stoppage, so they started running it back in this matchup. And if you watch that first matchup, Ramon was really... Is it Ramon or Raymond? Is it Ray, I'm going to say Tavares. I, don't, I think it's Tavares, so we'll just go with Tavares. Tavares was controlling that fight. He was controlling the range, controlling the pressure, landing some nice big shots, got sniped a little bit, went down to the ground. It was an early stoppage, but he was actually kind of controlling that fight. And I like that going into this matchup. The one thing that worries me is 
He's kind of a crazy dude. This dude, Tavares, is a wild dude, man. I mean, he is a fucking savage, wild dude. And you saw that he came back on the Contender Series a month later and knocked the fuck out of a guy. He seems like an emotional guy. He seems like a hot-headed guy. He came in and said, let me prove that I belong. He stood in the pocket, just started throwing wild shit, found the knockout. I think the same thing's going to happen here. He's going to get pressure, or he's going to he's gonna pressure uh, CD. He's going to get in his face, and he's going to stand there and try to knock this dude out for what happened in the last match of when I watch CD, he's a good fighter. He's probably the better fighter of the two. But I don't like the way he reacts to big pressure and big shots. It's not like I'm going to return fire. It's more of a, like a backup. Let me reset. And against Tavares in this matchup, I don't think he's going to have that time to be able to reset. Now, Tavares, he's already been chinned before. We've seen him get dropped. So there is a world where CD is able to find that shot again. But I believe... That Tavares' pressure, his power advantage, is going to get the best of CD in this matchup. We saw the kind of the writing on the wall in the first matchup. It looked like it was kind of headed that way. There was a shot, there was a shot, there was a shot. Okay, he's pressure, pressure. And then Tavares got clipped a little bit. Same thing could happen here, but I like the dog value in this matchup. Somebody that was controlling kind of the entire fight until the knockout. Give me the dog here. I'm going to Tavares to get it done. Let's move on to the next one. Jordan versus Sean Woodson. And I was actually really hoping that people would see the 10 and 1 Sean Woodson, six foot four and 145 pounds, whatever he is at this point in his career. The boxer, the Golden Gloves boxer, and they would put Sean Woodson at like a minus one thing, minus 150. And if Sean Woodson was the favorite in this matchup, Charles Jordan was going to be the easiest lock of the week of all time. It was going to be the easiest lock of the week of all time. I love Air Jordan. He is the more complete fighter in this matchup. And the only fights that Charles Jordan really loses it was is when somebody comes in and out wrestles and out grapples him. That's obviously not going to be Sean Woodson in this matchup. Charles Jordan, obviously Sean Woodson, everyone's always going to talk about his length. And he is one of those rare guys that has the length and uses his length with the front kicks, with the jabs. He keeps people away. He keeps people away. But Charles Jordan is not a guy that's just going to stop. He's not going to stop inside or play that outside range. He's going to get in the pocket. He's going to throw heavy. And we've seen Charles, uh, Sean Woodson beat Chin against Saldana. We've seen it before him getting hit. So there is that situation. Charles Jordan, I like the pace. I like the pressure. I like him to kind of wear down the tall, lengthy Sean Woodson. When you get Sean Woodson against the fence, holds to him having you against the fence. It's a completely different fighter. You got to watch out for those knees, though. If you're Charles Jordan against the fence, when Charles Wood or when when Sean Woodson's got his his back against the fence, you still got to look out for those knees. But take away the length. Get inside. I think Charles Jordan could start making this a, a pretty nasty fight and win this fight. But I will say this: I love Charles Jordan at dog money. I love Charles Jordan at even money. I like Charles Jordan at minus 130. It's starting to get away a little bit in my opinion. Let me check it live on stream right now. As I'm filming this video, we have Sean at plus 155. Charles Jordan minus 180 as I'm filming right now. Minus 180 is like right on the tippy top of what I would want to play on Charles Jordan. But I do think he's got the ability to get this fight done. He is going to be my pick. Let's move on to the next one. Brad Katana versus Garrett Armfield. Brad Katana is a guy that I've been watching film on him, and I, and I just, it's hard for me to figure this dude out. Because when I'm watching him, he's, he, he's a short guy, he's a stocky guy, but he seems a little bit stiff in there. No real footwork, he'll kind of just stay in front of you. He definitely does get hit, but the dude's kind of a tank. And it's like, all of a sudden, you're like, in that last fight, that, that the Ultimate Fighter uh, grand finale, whatever it was, it was like, oh, he's not the better fighter in this matchup. And then it's like, oh, but he just won that round. And then it's like, oh, he's getting beat. And then it's like, wait, he just won that round again. He's one of those fighters that just absorbs shots, gives shots back. And he's not a super powerful guy. But even outside of the power, he's able to find powerful shots. So it's not a power that's going to put you away, but it's a power that's going to beat you up. It's a power that's going to stop your momentum. And it's a power that is going to win you rounds. Just that one little moment in a close round, because it seems like every round that he fights is a close round. Gamer Arm Garrett Armfield... On the flip side, this dude's a dog. Came in three days notice, up in weight versus David Onama, a guy that he's already lost to before, was a minus 800 dog in that fight. And by the time the first round closed, he went, uh, Onama was almost, uh, was only a minus 250 favorite. He came in and just took it to Onama. Eventually, Onama got the takedown, was able to get control, got the submission win. But then he came out in his next fight, 
with the opportunity and showed improvements not only in the striking but the tenacity and was able to find a finish of his own i like garrett armfield as a person as a fighter he seems like he's got that dog instinct right he's got the power and i think that his cardio is going to be okay that was my only red flag in this because katana is going to be around i don't know if garrett armfield's going to have the power to put out a guy like uh, like katana he's definitely going to be able to land on him and if he gets a little bit too heavy-handed early he could gas but i think that there's enough dog and Garrett Armfield to not only maybe put away a guy like Katana, but find the big shots in the first round, find enough in the second round, bank the first two rounds, and be tough enough to survive the third when Katana tries to put on that pressure late. So I'm going with the dog here. Garrett Armfield, Katana's not a super dangerous guy, and you guys know how I love matching up my underdogs with people that aren't super dangerous against people that I think are absolute dogs. So I'm going to dog here, Garrett Armfield, to get it done. Could be a decision, could be a very close fight, or it could knock this dude out cold. Let's move on to the next one. Arnold Allen versus Evlov, and let me preface this by saying I'm an Evlov hater. I, I cannot stand Evloev, Evloev, whatever it is, the Diego Lopes fight, but I've said that he was overrated when he was supposed to fight Bryce Mitchell. Bryce Mitchell was going to be my lock of the week versus Evloev because I think like, I thought that Bryce Mitchell was going to be able to take the wrestling to Evloev, and I still believe that Evloev, the way to beat a guy like him is you have to be able to counter wrestle, you have to be able to put him on his back, and I thought that Bryce Mitchell was going to be the guy to be able to do that. Arnold Allen is not the guy that's going to be able to do that. I can't stand Evloev, but I'm trying to, my, my goal for 2024 is to put my personal biases aside, reassess the situations, reassess the tape that I'm watching without my biases, which is what I did with Movzar Evloev. And I got to say, this guy's good. <laughs> I mean, this guy's good, man. He is good. I Not only do I think that he's going to be able to get the takedowns he needs to win rounds, which he's a high IQ guy. He knows how to win rounds. If you watch Arnold Down versus Nick Lentz, which was the last kind of big wrestle that he fought, he defended all, all those. I think Nick Lentz statistically was 0 for 9 on takedowns. But Nick was still able to get to positions that you don't want Evloev to get to because Evloev will finish those takedowns. I will also say that even... Even if, and this is going to be a wild thing to say, but I really do believe this, even if Evloev is not able to get the takedowns, which a lot of people think he's takedown or bust, I believe that in a 15-minute kickboxing stand-up match, Evloev can win a fight versus Arnold Allen. I don't think that it's 100% of the time Arnold Allen wins a fight. I think Arnold Allen probably wins 60 out of, out of 100 times and, and just a stand-up only affair but Evloev is a really good striker he's really good at cutting angles on the strikes to avoid counter strikes and Arnold Allen can be a low volume counter striker type of guy he will throw a strike cut the angle and not only does he cut the angle to avoid the counter he will throw cut the angle and then dive in for a takedown and that's how he's able to get his takedown so I came out of this matchup breaking down film you guys know I've, I've loved Arnold Allen I'm very confident in Evloev in this matchup. I, Arnold Allen isn't a super dangerous guy. Obviously, Evloev isn't as well. But when it comes down to winning minutes, I think that Evloev is going to get the takedowns he needs. And even if he doesn't, I think that he can hang in the striking. One of the biggest question marks for undefeated fighters is how do they react to adversity? Well, I've seen Evloev not have easy fights. It's not like he's smoking everybody. He's had difficult fights. The guy doesn't panic. He works through situations, and I like seeing that, especially in a fight that could turn very close and ugly with Arnold Allen, but I like El Evloev to get the job done. Let's move on to the next one. Chris Curtis versus Mark Andre Barryu, and I've had my Let's say differences. These are both of these guys are, are very intriguing because I've picked against Mark Andre as my lock of the week. Chris Curtis has been my lock of the week multiple times, has never won as <laughs> lock of the week. This fight seems pretty, I want to say, easy for me to break down. It should be a boxing matchup. I mean, both these guys are kind of boxers. Chris Curtis obviously is like almost all boxing, good counter boxing, able to slip and counter. Mark Andre Barryu is a guy that wants to wear you down. You saw that when I had him with Julian Marquez, right? He was my lock of the week last year. Julian Marquez, I thought that he was going to be able to find the power on Mark Andre. Even if you're finding the power, Mark Andre is usually able to be pretty durable to eat those shots. And once you get tired, he jumps all over you. The issue with Mark Andre, Andre in this match versus Chris Curtis is Chris Curtis doesn't really get worn down in those type of fights. 
Chris Curtis can kind of slip and rip and counter box and, and fill his shell and do that type of stuff for 15 minutes. He's a, a, a Sean Strickland kind of clone in that regard. He can fight those fights for 15 minutes. So if this turns into a 15 minute boxing match and nobody is able to really kind of hurt the other person or whatever, and I think this is going to be a close fight, what do I have to do? I have to pick the better boxer in the boxing match. And I believe that Chris Curtis is the better boxer of the two in what is going to be mostly a boxing match, all things equal. So my pick is going to be Chris Curtis. If Mark Andre comes in and is able to get like crazy pressure, maybe get in a clinch situation, whatever, then that's how he's going to be able, be able to win the fight. But if he's just standing in front of Chris Curtis, Chris Curtis should be the better boxer. Mark Andre doesn't have like crazy power to kind of equalize what he lacks in the technique. And Chris Curtis is a good boxer. I think he gets back on track here. But this is like not a bet situation. He's kind of what what are the live odds right now? What are, what are the odds right now? We'll check this live. Minus 170 for Chris Curtis, a guy that's kind of dropped some fights. He probably shouldn't drop. I think this could be a close fight. Could be a close decision. Home fans, Mark Andre, judges could get weird. Chris Curtis kind of has a thing against judges. So I'm going Chris Curtis here. But I would be careful with that 170, uh, minus 170 money line. Let's move on to the next one. Neil Magny versus Mike Malott. And Mike Malott. I'll be honest. I think he's a little bit overrated. He, everyone's talking about he's like the next big thing, the, the next big prospect. He's 10 and 1. The guy's already like 32 years old. So he's not like he's some young buck. But this is, I mean, this is how you beat Neil Magny. And I try to tell Phil Rowe this, and I try and tell everyone that fights Neil Magny this. If you just fight your fight, you will beat Neil Magny because all these guys are very talented guys at this point that Neil Magny is going to fight. If you start fighting Neil Magny's fight, you're probably going to lose. And what does that mean? That means stay out of the fucking clinch. Just don't clinch with Neil Magny. I don't know how hard it is for people to understand and realize that when you clinch with Neil Magny, that is his style of fight. He wants to hold you. He wants to grab you. Even if you push him against the fence, this is what Phil Rowe was doing. Even if you push him against the fence, don't fucking grab onto him. Stay at range. Phil Rowe would have fucking smoked Neil Magny if he just kept him against the fence and was just boxing him. If you're Mike Malott, pressure him. Neil Magny will back up and just don't fucking let him grab you. Stay at range. Box him. If you want to try and get a takedown, you can do that as well. Just don't hold in the clinch. I think Mike Malott is going to be wise to that. He's going to get the job done. And uh, he's my pick. <laughs> Let's move on to the next one. Raquel Pennington. Myra Bueno Silva in one of the most anticipated title fights the UFC has ever seen. I can't even believe that they even bothered putting who? Who's the main event? Sean Strikeland versus Drykus Du PP. We got Sean Strikeland. I've never even heard of the guys in the main event. Everybody is tuned in. Everybody is ready, locked in to see one of the most pound for pound prolific. MMA fighters in all of history, Raquel Pennington, take on the young, up-and-coming, beautiful, Brazilian, dangerous grappling phenom with the hottest girlfriend in the UFC, Myra Bueno Silva. By the way, her girlfriend, Gloria DePaul. Hey, Gloria. Hey, how you doing? Listen, guys. It is what it is. It's the co-main. I understand the narrative behind it. Rocky getting a title shot is like... What? Whoa, whoa! You see, you hear Raquel Pennington, 15 and 8, fighting for a title, but good for her for getting there. I'm not going to trash her too much because she is, she's probably the better fighter of the two. Honestly, she's probably the better fighter of the two when it comes down to just pure fighting and technicalities and all this stuff and the way they, they, they fight. But Bueno Silva is a dangerous fighter. The issue is, and here we go again with like kind of the one plus one is two. Rocky loves the clinch positions. She loves to just kind of clinch and hold. And Bueno Silva, you saw versus Holly Holm, was kind of getting put in those positions and really wasn't doing anything to get out of them. She was able to find that ninja choke. But if she's not able to find that ninja choke here, is this going to be one of the most boring title fights we've ever seen with Rocky just holding on for dear life to get that title? And if she does, God bless her for her. That's what I would do. If I was Rocky and I knew Myra Bueno Silva was, was, was comfortable just being on her back in the clinch, I would grab her. I'd fucking push her against the fence and I would hold her there for 25 minutes, get my check, get my belt, 
Defend my title in, in, in four or five months, whatever it is, and get your money. But Myra Bueno Silva also is a girl that will just keep marching forward in the open mat. If you guys are at distance, she will just keep put pressure, keep the pressure. If it goes to the ground, she is so, so dangerous. So in a fight, that's probably going to be boring. If there's somebody that's going to finish the fight, it's probably going to go Bueno Silva. So I like Myra Bueno Silva to be able to find a way to finish this fight or be the more aggressive person because in a close fight especially women's mma if somebody's holding and other person is marching forward the judges typically lean to that person that looks like they're doing a little bit more and bueno silva should be that person that looks like they're doing a little bit more in space i'm going bueno silva in this matchup in event time we got sean strickland versus ddp DDP, one of my favorite wrestlers from the WCW era, but this is Drikus Duplessis. And let me just say this too. I was the, I would say the, the train conductor of the, the DDP hate train. I said that he was a, a 185 Jiri Prohaska. And why, what I mean by that is, is just throw recklessly, trust your chin, and hope you can knock the other guy out before you get knocked out. And when you fight a real fighter like that, you end up getting knocked out. And I said that with Jiri when he fought Alex, and that's exactly what happened. He finally found somebody that was able to find a good counter shot, and he got put away. I thought that Robert Whitaker, Bobby Knuckles, the Grand Reaper, was going to be that guy versus DDP. And DDP showed, hey, guess what? I'm better than people give me credit for. And hats off to him. So, after that moment, this is one of those situations where once somebody wins and they prove me wrong, I get in this mode where I am never picking against them until I see them lose. The other fighter on that matchup is going to be Macy Barber. I'm never going to pick against Macy Barber ever again. The other fighter is Bilal Muhammad. I was a big Bilal Muhammad hater. I'm never going to pick against Bilal again. But if you break down this fight, and I think that DDP's coach broke it down better than anyone has before. DDP's coach basically broke this down. I'm going to steal it, and this is going to be my breakdown for this fight. Sean Strickland went in against Izzy, and that was a Sean Strickland fight. Any fight that turns into a Sean Strickland fight, Sean Strickland is going to win that fight when he's able to move forward, when he's doing his little, his, his Philly show, and he's parrying, and he's countering, and he's pressuring, and putting people on their back foot. That's going to be a Sean Strickland fight. And if he's able to do that to, to, to Drikas, he is going to win this fight. If Drikas is backing up, mouth breathing, doing <sighs> doing the typical Drikas stuff, Sean Strickland's going to win this fight. But, but DDP's coach basically said, listen, when Sean Strickland does that, it works. And he basically said, like, listen, good luck. <laughs> because you're not going to push DDP backwards. He put easy on the back foot. Sean Strickland's boxing the entire time. And he's not a guy that can fight on his back foot. So well done to Sean. But good luck with trying that with Drickers. Because Drickers doesn't go back. I see that happening. I see DDP just constantly just moving forward and moving forward and working through those shots because Sean Strickland isn't a, a super dangerous guy. I don't think DDP is worried about those tight, enclosed shots if Sean Strickland's backing up. This isn't Sean O'Malley, right? Sean O'Malley backing up can kind of sit and throw those little tight little counters right in the pocket. Sean Strickland's going to be backing up, just kind of parrying and parrying and just try to fight. He needs to be on that open space, working that jab, extending shots, counter off you. And if you get in his face, which I believe DDP is going to get in his face. He is going to run into some trouble. The biggest question mark here, and obviously I can't, I can't believe they set this line at one and a half, by the way, because both these guys are durable. Only one of them, in theory, is like a dangerous guy. I think the one and a half is going to be over. But is DDP going to be able to hurt strictly enough or win enough rounds, one, two, and three, before the fourth and fifth rounds come where Strong Strickland should start to take over? I believe that DDP is much more capable of a five-round fight than people are going to give him credit for. Again, I was a DDP hater, but I believe that this guy is one of those guys. And I want to compare this a little bit to Dustin Poirier. Dustin Poirier looks like he is just tired almost all the time. You get to the second round of a fight, you'll see him. <sighs> but he just doesn't stop. Like, even against the fence, bam, he's, he's countering, he's slipping, he's still countering. I think DDP is going to be one of those guys where he's going to win the first round. 
We're going to get halfway through the second round. And people, the commentators, DC, whoever's on the call is going to start being like, oh my God, DDP, I don't like the language. I don't like the body language. I think he's tired. Almost like Pantoja versus Brandon Moreno, right? I was saying the same thing. Like, oh, Pantoja, just a little bit. Ah, I don't know if he's got it. It looks like he's going to start fading. That's not good. I believe in my mind. That it's, we're going to get to the second round. People are going to think that DDP is going to be fading. And then he's just going to stay around. And then boom, he just won that round. And he's going to stay around and land another big shot. And boom, win that round. If this goes to a decision, I still believe that DDP can win a decision for Sean Strickland. I believe that he can hurt Sean Strickland. I believe he can pressure Sean Strickland. And, you know, I am siding with DDP in this matchup with full respect for Sean Strickland what he does. If this is a Sean Strickland fight, he wins. If Sean Strickland's backing up, I think that he is going to lose this fight. And I think DDP can put the pressure and have the power. Maybe mix in a wrestling to take down or two to win this fight. But it's close. And I have not bet on DDP just yet. But this has been the full card breakdown for UFC 297. Make sure you like the video. Subscribe if you are new. We want picks.com. $10 a month. I'm telling you, this is the best value in the industry. Like the video. I think I already said that stupid. Appreciate you guys. I'm out. Peace.